Ya Ali Madad, thank you for joining us in this series of conversations during Mediation Week. We try to make sure that this is the time when we convey to the Jamaat and we assist the Jamaat to learn about new trends, issues, identification of other matters that may help you not only in resolving disputes, but in life overall and in general. I am very, very pleased today to have the opportunity to have a conversation with Alia Mawani. Alia has been with uh, uh, Global Affairs Canada for a long period of time, a 20 year career in uh, diplomacy. She is the first female ambassador, Muslim ambassador appointed by the Canadian government. And we are just so, so proud of her. It's really nice, uh, Alia, to be able to call you your excellency. But you know that we've known each other a long time. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna, you know, dispense with formalities, but I want you to know that we are just so proud of the fact that you are in the position that you are in. And we know that that can only have come with incredible hard work and dedication over a very long period of time. Uh, I am pleased to have the conversation with Alia today with respect to this area of diplomacy and peace building. Because when we think of conflict resolution, the idea of peace building and diplomacy is the, is the height of conflict resolution and prevention, which of course is the, is the key to, to the work that we want to do. And uh, to have that 20 year experience that I, we can draw on uh, is a gift. Uh, so thank you, Alia, for agreeing to, to, to join me in this conversation. And what I'd like to do is just start out with, with you reflecting on your 20 years uh, of experience in diplomacy, with your you know, circumstances and current, and the areas and ways in which diplomacy is successful and how that can be used in our everyday lives uh, as, we, as, as we go about our business, uh, living with challenges in life overall. So um, over to you for your wisdom, Alia. Thank you very much, Suli. Um, it's a pleasure to be with you. It's so nice to see you in, well, kind of in person. Um, and it's also a great honor to be in a conversation with someone who has been a mentor to me over the years. So thank you. Um, and um, just to be to be specific, I am the first Canadian Muslim woman ambassador, but not the first Canadian Muslim ambassador. Um, we've had a few uh, wonderful colleagues um, also, um, Muslim men, who, Canadian Muslim men who have been ambassadors and who are, are wonderful colleagues and have also been mentors to me. Uh, so I'm in very good company. And um, as of this year, actually, um, we are at 50% uh, of Canadian ambassadors abroad uh, being women, which is actually, uh, pretty amazing, and I think it's a it's very much a reflection of who we are as Canada and Canadians. Um, and it's not just about numbers, right? I think we do it because we we genuinely think that it actually contributes to better representation and better policy. And uh, so it's great to be part of that. Um, and it's been a concerted effort uh, by Canada, and uh, it's so far we're encouraging others to do the same as well. Uh, but I think it's uh, it's a good trend. Um, so. You know, I like uh, it's a it's a it's a great question, and um, in the twenty years, I can't believe it's twenty years. Uh, but just by way of background, um, for people who who don't know me, um, I've spent most of my career in this region in the Middle East. Um, I'm talking to you from Kuwait right now, and um, it's been fascinating. It's been an amazing journey. I started in Syria, uh, spent time in Iraq, Jordan. Uh, Saudi Arabia uh, for five years during a period of, of intense change um, and of course back and forth to Canada in between um, and I've been in Kuwait now for about 10 months and um, I'm a lawyer by background as well um, and so I was I was drawn to diplomacy for a few reasons but I think the key one is actually because I've always loved getting to know people and their stories and what motivates them um, and I think that that has an enormous linkage to mediation. Um, but, you know, really 
I think for me, diplomacy is about, you know, learning, learning people and places. And then through that, making connections to solve problems and establish partnerships. Um, and a lot of how we establish partnerships is about finding common priorities and values, uh, right? So um, if I come back to, you know, the core of it to me is, is stories. And, and so, you know, when we're, when we're looking at diplomacy, um, and, and as you said, it is, it's the height of conflict resolution in many ways. Um, but sometimes there's not even a conflict. Sometimes you're trying to uh, find common ground, establish a partnership and trying to find, you know, the best way forward. And, um, and so it really is, I think, about, about someone's story or about a country or institution's story, right? What is it that's brought them to the table? Uh, what are their motivations? Um, and, and also what, what's underneath it? Right. So you know, often what you have, whether it's a person or an institution, you have their stated position. Right. But then there's all the things that they don't say, which are almost more important. Right. right. What is it that they really want to get to? Um, what is the fear underlying the things that they're really concerned about? Maybe having to give up or, you know, are there sort of red lines like places that they won't go or can't go? And those are not always apparent. And so at least for me, what I found throughout my career is that the relationship part, building part is so, so important. And I think, you know, sometimes as Canadians, you know, we can be pretty, we can be pretty direct, right? Um, and almost sometimes a little bit transactional. We're friendly, but it's kind of like, ah, you know, let's get to the point. And I think, you know, I've spent my whole career in a region where relationship building is paramount. And so I remember, you know, early on as a sort of a junior diplomat, um, you know, being surprised at first, but also kind of realizing pretty quickly that, you know, I might have lots of initial meetings with people where we wouldn't actually talk about work. We talk about people's family. We talk about where they went to school. We talk about food. We talk about all kinds of things, but they were asking me questions. And I was asking their, them questions. And we were just trying to get a sense of each other. And then after that, when we did start to talk about work, it was that we were actually relating to each other as people. Mm -hmm. And that has definitely helped, I think, um, in my career, but also just in the way that I engage. Like I, I sort of don't go right for the pointy question right away. Um, I try to take the time to get to know people and, and, and I also learn about places much more doing it that way. Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, if I, if I think about, you know, my, when I think about sort of mediation and conflict resolution, um, so much of it is about your intention, you know, when you, when you go into a conversation, you know, knowing like, what am I trying to get out of it? What is my organization trying to get out of it? Um, you know, but, and how do I, how do I show up? You know, am I being transparent? You know, am I being clear? Um, am I genuinely interested in listening and having this conversation? Right. Um, because we talk a lot about listening, but active listening is hard. And sometimes it's really uncomfortable as well. Right. Yeah. Um, and, and stopping yourself from reacting, you know, and just really trying to, you know, trying to, to be in the conversation. Um, I think those are all really important parts of diplomacy. Um, and, you know, again, whether, whether you're, whether it's a conflict situation or not. Um, and, and I think things like, you know, dignity is a really interesting one, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, because even though diplomacy is about problem solving, I think you know increasingly what we're seeing right now in the world is we're seeing a lot of polarities, right? We're seeing um, very different world worldviews in certain cases. Um, people taking quite strong positions on issues that don't leave a lot of room for middle ground. And I, th I think if we're well, these things are complicated, and I think that if we are to try to move forward. Um, it's sometimes, it's, I think, often important to, you know, have the other party or parties um, be able to leave the conversation with some some sort of dignity, like not being in a position of being humiliated, right? mm -hmm. because um, that's not necessarily, that's not sustainable, it doesn't sort of bode well for what happens in the future. Um, but again, it's not, it, that's not an easy thing. Mm -hmm. And do you find that in those areas, um, 
a kind of neutral role and a party that is able to facilitate that um, helps move that that process forward? I think it does. And so, you know, I think sometimes countries, you know, or governments, you know, can be in that position. Uh, but often it might be others in the background. So, you know, there's the concept of shuttle diplomacy, right? Where you have, you know, maybe you'll have a couple of governments that are the main parties, but then you have teams of experts, maybe from within those governments or academics or people in the background who know the files very well, but can actually do a lot of the work behind the scenes to really get to, you know, what the drivers are. And that's often, you know, what creates solutions, right? Um, because people don't always want to come out um, clearly. They wouldn't come out publicly necessarily with what they're willing to give up or what they're willing to compromise on because that can, you know, they may feel that that makes them appear weak, whereas behind closed doors, um, with the right conditions, they might be willing to give a better indication of, you know, what they're, where, where there is some wiggle room, you know, I think on, on, on all sides. So I think it is, it is really important. And, I, and then I think that, um, you know, often, you know, for example, there are, there are countries in the world where, you know, we're sometimes trying to influence, um, they might not even be states, they might be non-state actors, right? right, where we're trying to influence behavior. And sometimes I think the tendency is just to think, well, oh, we can, we need to just talk to them. But we also need to expand it and talk to the range of actors that influence them as well, right? And that's very important. Um, and so, yeah, absolutely. I think it's important to look at the whole ecosystem and um, and then try to, and again, it might not always be a neutral party. Um, and I think, you know, we live in the real world. I think different parties are always going to have interests, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they can't help. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And in tr what are some of the techniques that you've been able to use when it feels that the, the parties have a, a, an intractable uh, conflict and it's not so easy to get to the root of it? It's, uh, uh, of course, patience is an important part of it, but is there anything else that you can think of that, that helps to move a party forward when they've really kind of backed themselves into a corner? That's a really good question. So, so yes, the patience is a, a key thing. I think you know the listening is also important, and, and trying to listen on a variety of levels to what are they saying, but what's behind it, and then helping to find maybe a different path forward or an area of compromise, um, or you know going back to your previous point, involving somebody or finding somebody who can help move the conversation along. Um, and then I think sometimes it's it's also being realistic about what you can achieve because I think the other thing is as much as we'd like to think that we can that every conflict can be solved, right? There are some that are quite intractable, and despite your best efforts, you might not you might not actually be able to solve it. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean you failed, right? But just being realistic about what you can and can't achieve. I mean, if I look at you know, some of the things that I've worked on in this region, one of the challenges sometimes is that there are groups that actually um, benefit or profit from situations of conflict. They have, you know, they get status in times like that, or they actually get financial gain in times like that, that they would not have, you know, in peacetime or in other times. And so it's not, you know, sometimes we come into it from the perspective that, oh, well, of course, everybody wants to solve this. Like, nobody really wants conflict, but that's actually not true, right? Some people, and and so recognizing that, and, and then if you get to, trying to get to the drivers, like, so if recognition is a driver, you know, for perpetuating a state of conflict, are there other ways that you can achieve that, right? Or um, the financial one isn't difficult, but I think those are, those are some of the things and, and the relationships because it's it's amazing how, I think one of the things that I found is it's amazing how you can build relationships sometimes with people who have a very, very different worldview. Um, you don't have to agree, but somehow you can still find a way forward uh, a lot of the time. Um, and that's, um, it's surprising on one level, but I think over 20 years I've seen it, I've seen it happen a lot. Um, and it can sometimes be the personal connection that it helps you to, to, to move forward. 
Thank you, Alia. This, you know, what one of the things that that uh, that you, this conversation has pointed out is just the parallels with the mediation work we do within the Jamaat for individuals, right? It is finding what is underneath the stated position is one of the most difficult parts of the mediation process. That's true with countries. It's true with us as you know individuals, and having that sense of you know reality testing of just what is it that, that can be achieved in this particular mm -hmm. outcome and, and, and circumstances. But so importantly, com coming to it with that sense of ongoing relationship, because of course, we are going to stay in the same Jamaat. There are many times when I say to people, you're, you're an Ismaili, you will continue to be an Ismaili inshallah, and you will continue to meet these people in Jamaat Kana and regularly and so on. And that's part of the relationship that needs to be endured and, and enhanced and enriched over that period of time. And so that sense of being able to work with disputes confidentially with a neutral party and being able to come to a compromise that helps us move forward. There are just so many parallels uh, to this work uh, and, and, uh, and, and focusing in on the values of empathy and compassion fair dialogue, transparency. Those are all the kinds of things that we are continuing to build as, as, as important parts of our, of our relationship with each other as we move yeah, forward. Yeah, absolutely. One other thing actually I wanted to mention and, and you kind of discussed it as well is, is language. Um, because it's about you know, the objective, but it's also how, that, how it's framed. And so you know, one example is when I think about resolutions in the United Nations, right? The Security Council or the UN General Assembly, where diplomats, you know, en masse sort of get together and negotiate statements or text about a particular issue. And often what happens is there's an initial draft and then the draft gets reworked as people feed into it. And of course, in the end, what you, what you want is you want something that has weight, you know, that is a strong statement about whatever it is, but you also want to get maximum buy-in, right? And so, but what's really interesting, I mean, but language is so important because the way that, you know, one country or a group of countries might frame something um, might not be comfortable for another group of countries and they might suggest different wording. In the end, we're all trying to get to the same place, but being open to the language, you know, being open to uh, how the framing of something can be the difference between, you know, not getting consensus and getting consensus. Mm -hmm. And there are always there may be times when, like I said, there are certain sticking points. But at the same time, having that openness, um, and that also means openness to somebody else's worldview, exactly. even if you don't necessarily agree, because you know, for example, states have differing worldviews in a lot of ways and differing interests. Um, they're not necessarily, and, and we can get ourselves into corners sometimes, but it's not necessarily right or wrong, they are, but they are very different. Um, some states think more short-term, some think, states think more long-term. They obviously are in different geographies with different resources, and all of these things impact where you stand and how, what you're going to be comfortable with in terms of framing. So the language, I think not only you know, in, in something like written text, but also in terms of the language you use during a mediation or a negotiation is so important because, you know, there's the, it's a kind of a cliche term, but, you know, the ter people say, you know, people always remember how you made them feel. feel. Right. And, and I think that that has a lot to do with this is you may not necessarily agree, but if people feel like they're being listened to or they feel that they're being valued in the process or being seen in the process, um, it's not perfect, but you're more likely to get somewhere. Thank you. That is such powerful advice. And it, it reinforces my view overall that we start with our little families and ourselves, and we replicate this all the times to the largest level. And it is still the same human emotions that, that carry us across all of that spectrum of life as we move forward. This has been a very interesting conversation, Alia, and I'm so glad to have had the chance to have this conversation with you. Thank you very, very much. Thank you for having me. It's great. 
I hope that you have found this conversation interesting and have been able to pull the parallels that I indicated earlier on. In all of the work that we do as, as the CAB system, in all of our lives overall, as we interact and have relationships with people, it is that fundamental point of view of how it is that we treat each other that creates the kind of environment, the kind of society, and the kind of community that is peaceful and happy. And that, of course, is our objective, not just conflict resolution, but conflict prevention, if it is at all possible. Thank you all for joining us for this uh, a series of conversations, and we hope that you have found them interesting and insightful. Wherever you are in the world, know that our prayers are there for your safety, your good health, for Mushkil Asan, and for immense baraka in your lives. Kuda Hafiz. Goodbye.